in 2018 or whichever year that this message eventually will be rewatched or listened to uh, some of the practical things that we can do and scriptural things to manage our finances and if you can pull your notes out we'll take some notes and I'll go through them very quickly the first one is I would encourage every person according to scriptures also is to have an emergency fund two-thirds of people living in the United States cannot cover one thousand dollar crisis and, and a half of people one and a half people cannot cover a five hundred dollar crisis your car gets towed get a flat tire and the microwave dies and you're in depression because you can't cover $500 crisis and one of the reasons why is because people don't set an emergency fund you have to learn to set certain fund that is for emergencies that doesn't mean you have to expect emergencies but it gives you a peace of mind especially when you're married especially when you have kids from two to three months or at least two months or at least one month start with one month so your your things can be covered and typically people who have emergency funds tend to avoid emergencies and emergencies tend to happen to people who don't have a fund to deal with them number two live within your means live within your means means live so that your expenses do not exceed your income and if your income increase that doesn't mean you have to increase your expenses there has to be a breathing room between what you're making and what you're spending when we were in North Carolina and this gentleman who God uses powerfully there he was ministering and he was very tall and he came up to pray for me and so he prayed for me and then he hugged me but he was tall and very strong he hugged me so much that and he was holding me I couldn't breathe and the whole prayer was about encountering God and I'm standing there and I'm I, I can't breathe and I'm like God a few more seconds and I will encounter you <laughs> and I'm praying initially I was praying for the anointing and after that I was praying that he lets me go because he didn't realize he's holding me so tight and I appreciate the compassion and love but I can't breathe and that's how many people live with their finances is their expenses are so close to their income they have no breathing room that's why couples fight all the time many people even get sick they can't sleep and so and many times what we do is we buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like and we kill the breathing room in finances it's always important to kill to keep a breathing room in your finances that means that you you, you can't spend on the level of your faith you can have you know images you want to drive a nice car wear nice clothes Wh whatever you have in your heart that's awesome keep it on your refrigerator but don't spend like you dream until you make that kind of money because otherwise you will have unnecessary troubles that will come from that breaking simple commandment or simple tip or simple advice amen number three is use wisdom in investing bible teaches us about investing investing is very important to send your money so that money can make more money for you but the problem with many people is many times they invest in what they don't understand or they invest with money they don't actually have if you have to borrow money to invest now there are cases where people honestly they just get a killer breakthrough but typically if you have to borrow money or pull money out of equity to invest that is already tells you you're doing something wrong you can't take the money that you need to feed your children and invest them you can only invest the extra that's why you need to save you need to cut back so you can have money to invest and don't invest in something that everybody's doing learn it for yourself watch videos get the books so that you will know what you are doing are you with me number four is avoid borrowing today we live in a world where everything is on payments the hat is on payments the socks are on payments belt is on payments the car is on payment the phone is on payment the phone case is on payment everything is on payments and the Bible says that the, that the person who borrows all the time is a slave to the lender and so that means that we have to learn to avoid as much borrowing as you can and the average in 2015 an average household credit card debt is was fifteen thousand dollars mortgage was one hundred seventy one thousand dollars the car loans were seventy uh, twenty seven thousand dollars and the student loans were forty eight thousand dollars learn to save money and buy those things with cash cash is the king and plus you can enjoy your phone you can enjoy your car better knowing that you don't have to worry about constantly making the payments now it's understandable sometimes with house and certain things you can make you have to get a loan there's no way you can pay for it and when you do make it your priority to pay that off as soon as possible otherwise that will swallow you up in the in discouragement and in anxiety number five work hard 
one of the principles of managing your finances in order to have finances you have to hustle you gotta work and you gotta work hard the bible says he who doesn't work shouldn't be eating now there are people who have disability there are people who are retired and elderly we're not talking about that but we're talking about young people who are sitting at home and only dreaming but doing absolutely nothing you can't prosper god god blesses the work of your hands not the dreams of your mind that means you gotta pu pull your hands out of your pocket and do something do something and if you're so like over here i can't do this kind of a job because that's below me humble yourself and then hustle come on somebody god is your source but the job is your resource in my house i have a hose that goes from my house and right now because of the cold weather the water in the hose got frozen so when i open the water nothing comes out it just drips why because the hose is it has ice there and many people because their habits are so bad with work god who is supplying blessing but your bad habits is the ice that actually keeps it from flowing and you only got dripping in your life if you constantly complain at your work if you show up on time instead of early that is late if you want promotion you can't come on time you're a christian you gotta be early if you want promotion you can't leave on time you gotta stay longer you gotta do better than other people you gotta educate yourself in the areas where other people get complacent and you will see the eyes the laziness the complacency that little self-entitlement bad attitude bad relationship with other employees when that ice gets broken God's grace to will flow through the hose of your job are you with me work hard next one is work smart Work smart is this, instead of buying things to compete with your colleagues, use money to buy things that will make money for you. Make money work for you. The Bible says in Matthew that um, one man took a talent and he hid it. That means he put all of the money just in savings. And like I mentioned, it's good to have savings. It's good to have emergency fund. But you got to be able to be creative so you make your money work for you. But those other guys, they took their money, they took their talents and they traded with those talents and they mo made more talents. And when the master came in, he complimented them and he says, you guys were faithful. Amen. The, the, way, you, the way you can do that is that sometimes, for example, instead of just buying a house, you can buy a rental property. Where you can rent one side and you end up really not paying for rent and you start looking for opportunities in which money can work for you or any other investments when i was younger at the age of 21 you know i first acquired a, a rental property but in order to get a property at 21 i had to take care of my credit at the age of 16. i had to instead of buying new things all the time i had to save that money so when the property appeared i had enough money saved up to pay for down payment and then through that property eventually acquired another property and now i can live at the age of 30 live in the house of my dream and sold those properties and everything because from 20 to 30 I had I hustled I'm not the smartest kid in the block but at the same time I knew that instead of just buying nice cars and impressing people who don't even care about that stuff and looking flashy on online and stuff I'd rather live maybe in a poorer neighborhood in a poorer house but I'm gonna save those money and then those money will work for me amen and so learn to make money work for you Number seven, don't cut corners, meaning don't cheat and don't lie. One of the things you can destroy your finances completely from ground up and not only your finances, your family, your marriage, your health, everything. If you start duping people, doing work, not paying people, uh, asking things and then not doing them and becoming a person who has a corrupt character. In the Bible, Satan is presented as a thief. Jesus was crucified between two thieves. Judas was stealing and eventually he, he had demons enter him. Achan was destroyed because of that. And one servant of Elisha got leprosy through that. In the area of finances, you got to be clean. That means you pay your taxes. That means you say what you mean and you mean what you say. That means that if somebody did a job for you, you pay them. You, 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 we, we can't do that. that. That means that you don't cut corners because when you do that, there will be a curse on your life. You don't shoplift. You don't take things that are not your own and you pull a pay a full price. And you don't, don't, don't develop this stingy, poor little me where everybody always owes you something. Because you will only attract that. Be a person who is blessed on the inside. Even if you don't have something, have a different mind. And then God will begin to release blessing on you. 
I cannot tell you how many people that I, I, when I preached this about finances and I had youth repent because they sold cars that were broken and people asked is there anything wrong with this car and they said no nothing is wrong but they knew they they only dimmed and, and killed certain kind of a alert and they sold a bad car. People who stole money from other people and then they started to have problems in their life and after they repented they saw change. Some people even reached out to someone that they sold things years ago and say I'm so sorry I'm gonna send you 300 bucks to compensate for the mistake I made because I lied to you when I did that. God wants us as Christians to be clean. It's better not to make more money but be not lose your integrity and not lose your honesty because eventually the devil will take whatever you are not being responsible with. The series is based on the book of Daniel. I want us to read Daniel chapter 5 and as we are going to cut a little bit more now what does it mean not to steal as well. Daniel is speaking to Belshazzar. He's saying but you his son Belshazzar have not humbled your heart although you knew all of this and you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them and you have praised the gods of silver and the gods, the gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone which do not see or hear or know. But the God who holds your breath in his hand owns all of your ways you have not glorified. Balthazar was a king of Babylon and Babylon is, is, an, is a nation, was a nation, was about 50 miles from Baghdad, uh, modern Baghdad. Babylon was started in, in Genesis chapter 10. It was one of the oldest cities. It was such a powerful city. It had walls as high as 300 feet up and as, as long as, as three chariots could ride on those walls. Uh, the walls were around Babylon for about 60 miles of circumference and they could be locked in the city and survive for over 20 years because of the water and the food supply in the city. Honestly you couldn't penetrate Babylon. It was so powerful, it was so strong and when the enemy surrounded Babylon in this verse we see that the enemy surrounds Babylon. And Balthazar, instead of planning how to defeat the enemy, and instead of being alert, Balthazar throws a party. But the problem wasn't with the party. The problem is that he used the articles that were dedicated to God's temple to be used only in God's temple. But his dad conquered the temple and he brought them to Babylon and Belshazzar in his drunk state pulls all of those articles dedicated to God and he fills them with wine and they begin to just party it up and as they're doing that an invisible hand shows up on the wall and he begins to write certain letters that he doesn't understand and the Bible says that the joints in his knees loosened and he started to shake uncontrollably he called all kinds of witch doctors and sorcerers and astrologers to begin to read and nobody could read it and they brought Daniel and the history says that in this incident Daniel was already an old man and you can see how Daniel speaks. He speaks like a boss. He comes to him and he gives him a history lesson. He says your dad thought he was something. He turned to an animal. He says you knew that. He says you saw that but you learned nothing from it. He says you're getting drunk he says, I don't care about that. What you do is your business. But he says, when you took something that belongs to God, he says, you provoke God. He says, and that hand says this. He says, God numbered your day and you've come to an end. Number two, he says, God put you on his scales and he said, he found your light. Not that means he's skinny. It means that there's nothing, there's no reward in his life. His life is actually worthless. It didn't mean anything. And he says, thirdly, he says, the thing, everything you worked for, Tomorrow is going to be divided and given to another kingdom. He said, you're done. I was pretty serious. I don't want to be Belshazzar. The point here is not against drinking, even though that's not the point here. And that's not what I want to preach about today. What I want to preach about today is this. It almost seems unfair that God holds Belshazzar accountable for using something that's supposed to be given to only to his kingdom when he abused it for his own pleasure. Belshazzar wasn't a Jewish man. Belshazzar didn't serve God. It almost seems like God, what he does with his possessions is his business. 
that's none of your problem but but God saw that these articles belonged to him and they only had to be used in his temple I want to ask you today are there things in your life or in our finances that God sees as they belong to him and we use it on our own pleasures I want to ask you today do you worship the God of gold silver and iron and I want to ask you today when you die and God puts all of the things you've done for his kingdom will the scale move and I want to ask you today when you die whose stuff you're losing your health sleep and ruining your life to get whose stuff where did that stuff will go will it go with you or will it go to your relatives and they're gonna hire lawyers it's like a pig and a cow had a meeting and the pig looked at the cow and says I give to humanity and you give to humanity but they like you more and they don't like me the cow says the problem with you is that you only give when you're dead I give when I'm alive learn to be generous when you're alive come on somebody amen 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 Saint Augustine he said where your treasure is where your pleasure is there is your treasure where your treasure is there is your heart and where your heart is there is your happiness I want to encourage every person today to live for eternity and to view our finances from the day when you're going to stand before God and you're going to be put on God's scales and how weight, how much weight are you going to have then because all of all of our life will come to an end no matter how great we live it no matter how poor we were how rich we were how healthy or not so healthy we will stand before God and we will give an account for God for our life I want to look at the second verse uh, the second uh, scripture in Malachi and we hear this verse all the time and so I want us to look at it through a fresh way one more time in Malachi chapter 3 verse 7 it says the following return to me and I will return to you says the Lord of hosts but you said in which way should we return so I want you to see that God tells people of Israel return to me and then God says I will return to you and of course people have common sense so they say God how should we return to you do you want us to do what and then God answers how we can return to God and he answers with this question he says will a man rob God yet you have robbed me but you say in what we have robbed you again God says can you rob God and God says you robbed me and we say how could you rob God and God explains if we go to the next verse in tithes and offerings you are cursed with a curse for you have robbed me even this whole nation and then God gives them instruction he says bring all the tithes into the storehouse means into God's house that there may be food in my house and try me now in this says the Lord and then he gives awesome promises so I want to look just for a few minutes right now into what is tithing we practice tithing as Christians and once a year or once in two years we give a, just a brief explanation of what it is so I want you to write this down those of you who are coming maybe today for the first time um, you came to a very good service those of you who've been coming for some time and the issue of money uh, raises your blood pressure in church and you hate church because pastors always talk about money and they want your money um, and everything uh, we are going to kind of dismantle a lot of these arguments today through the word of God God's word says a lot about a lot of things in our life that we sometimes don't maybe even want to hear but just because we don't want to hear that does not mean we don't need to hear number one number two money is something you need money is something that you come in contact every single day and Jesus talked a lot about it the first thing about tithing is that tithing is returning to God according to the scripture we see that God says return to me one of the ways you will know that somebody's heart begins to come back to God is when their wallet gets converted talk is cheap amen Come on if you're if you're a young lady if a guy says he loves you but he won't pay for dinner he don't love you I don't care how many emojis he sends you every single day he doesn't buy anything for you okay what, what will you tell him you say listen honey talk is cheap 
that's it and that's exactly how God sees the Bible says where your treasure is there is your heart and many people who will come and say things like oh I love God I love God and everything but when they're not generous God says you're now reflecting my nature because I didn't just love you I gave my son I didn't go I didn't give a janitor from heaven maybe some of the other lower angels I gave the best because that's how love is reflected number two tithing is about trusting in God God said try me now this is the only time where you can test God and, and not get in trouble Israel tested God and the Bible says it didn't go so well for them but in here God invites us and God says test me number 10 in the Bible is a number of a test God gave 10 plagues to test the heart of Pharaoh to test the heart of Pharaoh God gave 10 commandments to test the heart of Israel we see the 10 virgins we see also the 10 day of fasting the 10 day of testing in book of Revelation so number 10 is the number of testing one of the reasons it's a 10 percent is because tithing is the only thing where you're testing God and God is testing you it's about a test which is about trusting in God number three is tithing is about bringing not giving we read in Malachi where God says bring the tithes into my house God didn't say give the tithes into my house when we were in North Carolina and the guest speaker who was there um, one of one of the guest speakers was there he wanted to meet with us for dinner but we didn't have a car there and so a guy named Vlad from Arkansas borrowed me his Ford really nice and beautiful car took me a while to get used to it because it has so many nice little bells and whistles I remember I took his car we went to the restaurant we came back and the next day imagine what would have happened if the next day I would come to a guy named Vlad and tell him hey I just really felt led by God to give you this beautiful car and give him his car keys and say I just want to bless you with that car I didn't give him his car keys I brought him his car keys so when God says bring the tithes he's saying you're not giving it to me you're returning what's already been mine I'm just letting you keep the rest of the 90 percent so let me take a step further if you don't return the keys who do I become then a thief that's why God says you rob me I mean this is how God sees it I didn't write this I wouldn't have the audacity I wouldn't have the cleverness God says this bring it and he says when you don't bring it so God has this view that he owns everything we tend to sing that as well we agree with him he owns us because he created us he died on the cross for us to redeem us and so God actually owns everything and God says I want you to return 10% as your way of trusting in me and acknowledging that I own everything and I will bless the rest of the 90% and I'll let you keep it and you should be grateful that means when you give 10% you should, you should not feel generous you should be grateful that God let you keep 90. Amen. Number four, tithing goes to a local church. Bible says we give tithe, God says bring the tithe to the storehouse and that there will be food in my house. So practically what it means is tithing goes to the church where you serve, church where you go church where you help church where your local church um, some people you know they give their tithe. I had uh, one person who one time came and is like hey pastor Lad, I just want to sow my tithe into you and I said that's not scriptural you can't be sowing your tithe into me you gotta bring the tithe into the local church I bring my tithe to our church and so should you I'm not the church I am <laughs> one of the servants here I am not the church you can't bring your tithe and give to somebody on the street that is not tithing according to the scripture Tithing according to the scripture is we bring it to the local church. We can do charity outside of the tithing. We can do other things but the tithe, the 10% goes to the church where you go. And last one, tithing was encouraged by Jesus. This one I get a lot of questions on because people say, well that's great lad, it's all Old Testament. This was all under the law. Well first of all, Abraham the father of faith who received righteousness by faith tithe. Jacob tithed other people way before the law came in they practiced that I don't know who taught them but somehow they discovered God's character and God's nature and they practiced that and God blessed them 
but I want you to see a verse in the Bible and let me settle a lot of questions and doubts that you might have by presenting to you what the scripture says in the New Testament about tithing. In Matthew 23, 23, it's so easy to remember. Matthew 23, 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and something, something good and have neglected the weightier manners of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These ought to you have done without leaving the others undone. So these are the words of Jesus, they're in red. I want you to see what Jesus is convicting the religious people of the day is they were tithing and they were focused on tithing so much that they even were tithing leaves on the trees of their backyard. I mean that's pushing it okay. That's really pushing it. They were like tithing mint. So if they have a tea, they took, they saw like three leaves. They, they would try to cut one tenth of that. I mean, they were really, really radical. And Jesus says, and Jesus says, you know, guys, <laughs> but the bigger things, which we know, what's bigger than tithing is justice, is mercy and faith. He says, you guys neglected these. And then Jesus summarizes, he says, these things you ought to have done means justice, mercy and faith without 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 Jesus didn't say oh you should focus on love mercy and justice period he says you should do this this without leaving others undone Jesus wasn't canceling them tithing out of their backyard leaves he was saying make sure you put priorities in order and don't just tithe out of the leaves in your backyard and then you go around killing people but he wasn't saying that tithing shouldn't be practiced by followers of Christ. In fact, I believe if you're a follower of Christ, tithing is just a baseline. It's only where you start. It's not where you finish. Don't focus on that. Why Jesus never focused so much on tithing? Most of the guys he asked to follow him gave everything. So I'll stick with the tithing first. <laughs> we'll work to that part a little bit later. Are you with me? In the end, I want to share with you my personal experience with this also and the experience of people in our church but before saying that let me encourage you that Jesus's ministry it really touched me this week that Jesus though being empowered by God and being God on earth he relied on human gifts for example he needed Mary's womb Mary borrowed her womb we don't tend to think like that he needed the gifts from the wise men. He eventually needed the boat of Peter. He eventually needed the lunch of a boy. He needed someone's mode of transportation, the donkey. He also needed money that were women were supporting, their husbands were making the money and the women were bringing it to Jesus' ministry. He needed that money to spread his message. Now this was God he did not need anything but he was filled with Holy Spirit and he chose to rely on the contributions of people around him to continue to move in his ministry and even when he died he didn't get buried in some in some kind of a space he got buried in someone else's tomb who borrowed that to him so I want you to see that Jesus' ministry from beginning to end was only effective on this earth because people were willing to contribute to it if you would be here today and you would say, man, if Jesus would be on earth, we well, wouldn't be talking about this. We, we won't be needing this. Jesus would like, poof, and it would happen. Um, you watch too many movies. That's not in the Bible. Jesus relied on the contributions of people around him. And we should never as a church be ashamed to talk about it and encourage us to do the same to spread the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. Let's put our hands together for Jesus Christ. How do I give? How do you give? How can you start giving? One is tithe. I highly encourage every person, if you haven't done that before, to tithe. Make a decision. Take first 10% of your paycheck and you set it aside and you bring it to God. Don't wait until the end of the month to see if you will have left because the devil will really give you a lot of sales and clearances. And then by the time the end of the month comes in, you won't have time. You won't have money. The Bible says to do it first. In doing it first, you're trusting it in God. Amen. I remember hearing a, a testimony of Julie. Last year 
she was encouraged to she had a salon she had a uh, and she still has a salon where she does people's hair and she was uh, encouraged to tithe and she tithed before but Julie was she heard a message from here that sometimes you can increase your tithe to the desired income that you would like to have so instead of waiting to increase of the income you actually increase the tithe so God can increase your income and so she heard that it was spoken from the stage so she decided this year to increase her tithe to the, her desired income and within few months her salon had to be moved from one place to another for those of you who do here you understand that sometimes it's very difficult you start losing customers and on the top of that she actually got a new idea to do something else where she started to do eyelashes and toward the end of the year she testified last week and she said I've seen my business grew to the tithe I started to give in January Ivan also shared, Ivan and Katrina shared a very good testimony with me where Ivan applied to be a security guard uh, in one of the places uh, in Tri-Cities. Last year he had an application, it went through, he went through first interview, everything was good, he went to second interview and I think as, on the third interview he scored 60% but he was supposed to score 70% score so he didn't pass. He leaves the interview and God convicts him. He says, it's interesting. You're not tithing 10% and it's 10% you missed. So he got convicted because he wasn't consistent. He treated it like, oh, whenever I have it, kind of like a tip, you know, uh, good service. Okay, I'll give him five bucks and stuff. Not good service. No, nah, not giving anything today. So he, he kind of, you know, and that's how people treat uh, tithing, like tipping. And he made a decision. I'm going to start tithing. Him and his wife started to tithe consistently and even above that. And then he applies for this position in, in a very, very good uh, company in Tri-Cities. And there's 400 applicants. They're way better equipped than him. And guess who gets chosen? He gets chosen for that job. Now, he says that. He really believes as a witness from the Lord that when he became faithful in this area that God started to bless him in that area. Same thing happened with Katrina. She says when she applied for the job she right away got it and then within a month she got a promotion and the next month she got a raise. And so and she they, and they both said he said we see God's faithfulness when we are faithful with God's word in our life. Amen. And so I would challenge you. I would challenge you with this challenge. For 12 months you make a decision that you're going to tithe. If it, nothing changes within six months, stop. Bible says to try it. And if it doesn't work, yeah, you may say, well, is this some kind of a gimmick? I didn't come up with it. God says it is. God says it is. God says try it. If it doesn't work, just, you just go to heaven and say, God, you told it worked. It never worked. Give me my money back. <laughs> but be careful so God doesn't send you to hell with your money. <laughs> yeah, you're like, okay, God, keep the money. <laughs> just get me the ticket out there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Try it. I grew up in a family where my dad didn't even give us an option. My leg got broken at the age of, um, I think, 13 because uh, somebody ran over me and they... <laughs> On, on a bicycle. I was on a bicycle. They ran over me until the, my leg got broken and then the insurance paid paid off some money and um, I remember you know holding I think it was like six thousand dollars for a 13 year old. When I got the money I was 16 years of age. For a 16 year old uh, 15 years ago uh, six thousand dollars? That's like seven million. I looked at that. I mean my, my I started swallowing. My heart's blood pressure started rising. It was so amazing and dad gave me another envelope and he says and this is the tithe. And I said, what do you mean this is a tithe? That's, that's mine. He says, oh no. He says, that's not yours. That goes to God. And he says, and I will give you to give it to him. And I was like, what if I, you know, don't? He says, mm-mm. <laughs> yeah. And so, and he taught us from, from the mothers, from growing up in the family, this was like a law. Christian, you're not Christian. It doesn't matter. You need to give to God, period. Because you want God as your partner. And so, and I'm glad for that discipline that my parents instilled into me. Number two, I personally, I give to my pastor. 
Now the reason why I decided to mention that is because this message will be watched all around the world and will be rewatched decades later. I genuinely believe as in the Old Testament people would bring also um, things to the priest that you have to learn to honor your mentors, your pastors or your parents even financially. First with prayer but also financially. I had a person come up to me this weekend run up and without even saying hi and how are you he quickly said it worked it worked and I said worked what worked I, when I was in his city he came up to me and he asked me because he was struggling with his pastor relationship and it seemed like he wasn't clicking with his pastor and I asked him two questions I said do you pray for your pastor he says well if I don't forget I do I said secondly when was the last time you gave him a gift he looked at me like I asked him if I if he killed his pastor he looked at me he's like you're like bribing and I was like gift <laughs> he's like why would I want to do that and I was like because something is wrong with your heart and the gift will clean that up and then maybe something is wrong with your pastor's heart and the gift will clean that up too <laughs> that's exactly what I told him he was a college student so I was like I know you probably don't have a lot of money and I was like just just a small coffee the Bible says if you give to a prophet a cup of water you will get his reward if Jesus would have been in 21st century he, he would say if you give to your pastor a cup of coffee you'll get his reward <laughs> guys that's Jesus do you know what this actually means that if I bless my pastor everything my pastor worked for all his life God wires to my account I'll be buying cups of coffee the only thing is the pastor doesn't like coffee <laughs> I really believe that we have to be as Christians that doesn't mean bribing it doesn't mean you have to give give money but you have to live your life I want to build a culture in our church where we honor the pastors why many of you sitting here you don't know you will be a pastor and one day you'll thank me that I mentioned this and build a culture <laughs> like, praise you Jesus I didn't like it when he was saying but now that I'm a pastor God bring that message back we will have churches all around America and many of you, you will go that you don't even know now but that God has a call for your life. We want to build a culture where pastors not just criticize constantly, constantly attack but where we as a church, we honor and we sponsor and we encourage them with small prayers, with small tokens of appreciation and also with giving. That's what I do. I'm not saying this for you guys to do that to me. My heart is pure when it comes to this. I'm sharing with you what I've been doing already for years and what I will continue to do. Number three, what I believe is also very important is to bless other ministries. Now you might be only today on this level and you're not, you're like that's it, tithing is like that you've lied, you fried my brain, I, I can't take it anymore. You just just kind of put it in the refrigerator for now in the freezer let it freeze for a little bit and then maybe one day the Lord will bring it up but learn to bless other ministries why I do that is because I believe you have to sow where you want to grow and you have to sow where you want to go if you have a seed you don't sow a seed into the worst soil in Tri cities and expect a harvest you look for the best soil so you look for ministries where God is doing where something you feel like man this this resonates and you bless those places and God will use them to do that and Mary one time she had savings worth of a whole year's salary and she took all of her savings and instead of just finding poor people which is very good and very important and I'll mention that in a minute but Mary took and bought a perfume not for herself she went and opened the perfume and poured it on the body of Jesus I mean let's just imagine this like thirty thousand dollars worth of perfume poured on the body of Jesus and he's gonna die a day later so your first reaction is like a waste so Judas actually said that if I would have been there I probably would have thought that wouldn't have the audacity to walk, walk it out but I would thought that Judas said it, it's, it's a waste she should have given it to the poor have you ever looked at somebody who's blessed and thought the same thing they should sell everything and give to the poor don't raise your hand <laughs> the interesting part is anytime people say that I ask them back what have you done to the poor because you know the you know the jeans you're wearing you have two of them you can give one to the poor you know that you have a car you can ride a bicycle 
so it's crazy how we don't push ourselves but because we have Jesus looked at Judas and he says the poor you have always with you but he says you don't have me always with you and he actually complimented the woman and Judas who pretended to care for the poor you know what he did to Jesus he killed him a lot of times you're either generous or you actually pretend to be generous in reality a person who really has just no desire to help other people I don't want to be like Judas I want to be like Jesus I want to be like Mary I want to help other ministries um, a friend a friend of mine from our church most of you know him Edder as long as I knew Edder in the young young days of our life when Edder came to our ministry Edder was the most hard-working person I knew he hustled he had more jobs that and he would switch jobs quickly he could find jobs like this he always worked and he always worked very hard but there was one thing that I saw in Edder in the early stages of our friendship is Edder always lacked finances and I couldn't know anybody who worked harder than him when he got married he started coming to our church and I started to teach about this that we need to learn to give and to be generous me and my wife went with his and uh, with him and his wife to Olive Garden on Sunday and he mentions to me, he said, Vlad, I want to give $700 to one particular ministry. I knew Edder's situation. And my heart almost sunk. I'm like, this guy, he's struggling. And he's about to go really struggling. Because, and I'm thinking, and if I wouldn't be talking about it, he wouldn't get those crazy ideas. So I'm, I felt bad for me. And I was about to say, Edder, that's not for you, bro. That's like for other people. Don't do that. Why would you want to, especially to who? To that ministry? I'm pretty sure they have just enough money. They'll survive without your money. But as I was about to open my mouth and stop him, I felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Say, Vlad, I'm about to deliver him and you're going to abort it. And painfully, I said, Edder, I think this is from God. <laughs> Two months later about I think two months or three months later I meet him and he says I have three paychecks laying on my desk and I don't need to cash them because everything is paid for Edder some other time later Edder gets an idea to be a photographer today he's been featured on more magazines that I had a chance to hold in my hands in Tri-Cities and all around because of his photography and it's not, it's not that God gave him more money. God enlarged his sphere of influence. He found his passion. And there are things that God has done that I'm not at liberty to share on the stage that I know, that I've seen. I've seen a change in this man's life. And I'm not saying it's only because of that, but I know that when we live like Jesus lived, disciples live, we begin to see the grace of God flow in our life. Are you with me? Come on somebody. Number four, we bless those who are in need. We bless those who are in need, means those people who are hurting, those people who are suffering. And it's not always financially. Sometimes we can give him something that we're about to sell. We can bless somebody that we, we have something extra that we can share with somebody. And God wants us to live like that. I asked Mike and Anna today, a good friends of mine, about giving. And this is what Mike told me. He said, Vlad, the more we give, it seems like the more we can save and bless others with. Also, it gives me peace of mind because I know that God is in charge of my finances and He will always have more than enough. When they started to come to church and I remember when he started to tithe and he started to also contribute so that we help those people who are in need. Sometimes people need a car, sometimes people need a, a washer or a dryer or some other things and he would be the first one to say hey we will donate 500 bucks, we'll give 300 dollars to help in this particular need and I look at their life and I see change in their marriage, I see change in their finances. It seems like every person who gives they say this one thing there's always enough and every person who doesn't seems to have only one problem, it's never enough. And number five, give sacrifice. A sacrifice is something that, that hurts, something that stretches you. And sacrifice is something that, for some people, sacrifice is actually the first thing. But then when you get used to tithing, it becomes like automatic. Sacrifice is something that you do maybe once a year or once in two years. For some people, maybe once in three years, where you give something so precious that honestly, it's on your mind for months, and maybe for a half a year and it stretches you on the inside and it changes something on the inside. 
I watched a story of a lady named Galena this morning. Galena had a husband and her husband was in a coma. She needed money to keep him in the hospital. She had no money so she went she got a credit for $68,000 in Ukraine. The husband pulled through everything was fine economy crashed in Ukraine and she no longer owed 68,000 she owed hundred twenty thousand dollars her husband came from a coma he he was so mad at her the people she borrowed money from went bankrupt so she now got a deeper problems debt collectors were always on her footstep her husband though he recovered he couldn't work so he was on disability and she had three children she jumped into real estate, she jumped into being a counselor, she worked as a counselor but she was not able to scratch just to even pay the interest and she had an accident where her husband died and things went so bad where she honestly didn't want to live no more. Three children, she has a hundred twenty thousand dollar debt that she, 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 they don't even focus on food, they just want to keep away the debt collectors and she started crying out to God. As she went to pray by the river one time, God spoke to her and God said, you got all of that dead in one day and in one day I will wipe it out. She goes to church. She goes to a particular church where pastor was teaching about giving and sacrifice. She got encouraged, she got prayer and she got her first break. She got a real estate deal where she made $3,000 cash. And in Ukraine, three thousand dollars is a lot of money. Sometimes people make the most is two hundred dollars a month or three hundred. So three thousand is big money. But it wasn't enough to solve her problem. You know what she did? She took all three thousand dollars and gave it to the church. And she said, "God, it's not enough to fix the problem." But she says, "I'm going to do it for the first time. I made a lot of mistakes. She says, I'm going to trust that you will multiply three thousand by one hundred, and you will take care of what you promised me." During her counseling session, a man walks in who had problems with depression and other things. She counseled him and everything. And during one time, she, he looks at her and he says, you helped me so much. Do you have any problems that I can help you with? She says, no, I don't. He pressed. He says, be honest. She says, I do. I have $120,000 debt. And she broke down. He asked which bank and which organization she wrote to her. He says, tomorrow I will take care of it completely wiped her debt the Bible says give and it will be given back to you press down shaking together I want you to watch this men will give into your bosom how it will come into your life through men and women sometimes it's you working and somebody becomes kind to you for no reason Sometimes somebody opens a door for you and you find money in that opportunity. Sometimes somebody shares something with you and it triggers something. It's going to be men that God is going to use in your life to bring something into your life. Sometimes it's like this. I remember I was blessed with a, with a new phone. Somebody gave me two new uh, iPhone 8s. And so, but I wanted iPhone 10. But iPhone 10 wasn't out yet. <laughs> And so I was about to sell the two new phones and my wife says I'll keep the iPhone 8 and I was like I'll sell my 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 8 the one somebody gave me and then I'll, I'll buy the iPhone 10 and as I was about to put it on for sale I feel the prompting a person's name flashed in my mind who's from another state on the other side of America to give that to him that's how it works I quickly messaged them I asked them for the address and the iPhone was shipped the interesting part is that person I found out this week somebody gave him an envelope and there was money there not even opening the envelope during an offering at church he dropped it in the offering and he says God I'm giving it to you but he needed a new phone little did he knew that somebody from a Washington state was about to sell I mean literally I, his name just just surfaced in my mind that God would connect somebody there man will give into your bosom this week as uh, there was a minister there Andres Busoni and we were going there I was really wanting him to pray for me but I'm one of those people I, I don't ask for prayer for impartation if I don't bring anything in my hand and so but the day before he arrived uh, me and my wife uh, we emptied our accounts and we gave all the money away it was painful I was sick in my stomach but I felt it was from the Lord and I talked to my wife and she says Vlad let's do it 
we only left enough just to pay the bills for this month and um, and we felt so good because I know God has taken us on another level God's been always stretching us and we have not been stretched for a while because we got so comfortable with our giving and they got stretched like a rubber band and it hurt for a few hours but it was so sweet I felt God's presence and everything the moment service was done I walk into a cafeteria two people walk up to me one person gives me a check and the other person gives me a check and so I looked at it, I was like wow praise God but the other check is empty it doesn't have my name on it and as I go into my room the Lord start prompting in my heart he said you wanted that minister to pray for you and you wanted to bless him but you had nothing I gave you two checks one to give and one to bless you with when I met with that minister and I, I blessed him right away I said hey listen I, I didn't have anything to bring he's like what are you talking about he's like I'm like this is just between me and God don't worry about it and I was like I just uh just want to bless you and I just ask you that you pray for me before I even said that he says I've been watching your ministry he says, I know who you guys are. He says, I want to meet with you. And I said, well, we'll do that later. But right now, we want to pray. And he said something when I gave him that, that honestly, I believe will change my relationship with God forever. He said, when I saw you yesterday in the prayer, he said, God's Spirit told me that you are Holy Spirit's friend. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. And something, uh, since then, I started to sense a relationship with God that, that went to just another level. Just having that confirmation that Holy Spirit knows me and the Holy Spirit thinks I'm His friend. It's worth my whole life. And so God has a way to answering your needs. God has a way of touching your life. But I ask you that you be attentive. I'm not sharing these stories. It takes courage to share what I share with you right now like everyone else I want to keep it private and keep it secret the only reason I share it is because I know that people need to be encouraged to be generous amen thank you for watching this content I hope this was a blessing to you if you're like me and you like to click on things click on this subscribe to our channel and the content will come to you every time we post it and remember the best is yet to come